just because uh, it's probably a good thing to do. So, so last time when you guys were here, I think this is the last slide that Professor Marinescu went, went over, okay? We were talking about what happens when a star search has gone wrong, right? So last time you guys also talked about admissible heuristics, is that correct? Yeah. So what is an admissible heuristic? So an admissible heuristic is one that is optimistic, one that is always going to be um, less than or equal to the true cost of getting to the goal. And that's good for a bunch of reasons. We don't want to overestimate, right? Because then we're not guiding it in the right direction. But here's an example of something where a star search can go wrong. Okay. So let's sort of revisit what happens in the search tree here. And I'm going to be writing on the iPad so that people on Zoom can see as well. So again, if we're thinking about how do we do A star, right? When we're using A star, we're going to use for our cost function f of n. That is going to be equal to the backwards cost, okay? So the cost for getting to that node plus the heuristic of that node, okay? So remember, um, this g of n is the, what we call here, backwards cost. And this h of n, of course, is our heuristic at the node, okay? So, if we start at S, right, there's no backwards cost, right? That's where our zero comes from here. And we just add the heuristic at S, which is two, okay? Now, if we go down the search tree and we say, okay, we have two choices, right? We can either, we can search through A, okay? So that means we, we do the cost from S to A, which is one, plus the heuristic, which is four. So we get to five. Or we take the heuristic of B, okay? or the, I should say the, we take node B, where we use again, the backwards cost. So that's a cost of one plus the heuristic of B, which is equal to two, okay? Hopefully this is, did, did my mic just go out? Dead battery, great. Uh, one second while I replace that. So this should all be reviewed to you guys, right? You guys saw this last lecture? Um, I'm just gonna run through it one more time. Sorry, I wanna replace this so the recording comes. Okay, are we, okay, good, we're back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so now if we are to take this path, okay, then the decision that we want to take is we want to go to B, right? Because that's the least cost path. So from B, we have one choice. We can go to C, okay? It's backwards cost. So the cost of getting to C is three plus the heuristic at C, which is one. So that's four, right? Great. So we are still at the least cost path. Okay. So then we're going to choose to explore C. Okay. And that takes us to our goal. Okay. Which has a cost of one plus two plus three, which is six plus the heuristic, which is zero. So what happened? Did we, did we get the best path here? No, but but a heuristic is admissible, right? So what happens here? Yes. Exactly. So what happens here, our heuristic of B is too optimistic. And not only is it too optimistic, right? What's happening is that it is not equatable to taking this path, right? There's basically some sort of cycle. Yes. So we find a solution on a GQ Node. Yeah, so we do find it when we DQ the end node, but I'm I'm kind of showing this with um I'm showing this with um for example's sake. But yes, we do do that when we DQ. So what the issue is here, right, is that sometimes we don't want things to be too optimistic. Okay. So um essentially what we need here is we need a um we need a better type of representation for our heuristics. So what we're basically finding here is that when we have graphs, okay, what's basically happening is that when we have graphs, we need a stronger notion for what it means to be a good heuristic. And that's what's going to lead us to having consistency of heuristics, okay? So what consistency of heuristics means is 
it basically means that we uphold the triangle inequality, okay? So that means that the cost from one node, A, to C, okay, plus the heuristic at C, okay, is always going to be less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to, excuse me, the heuristic at A. Okay, another way to say that is you can basically um, bring the C over to the other side, right? And you say that the cost of going from A to C is strictly greater than the difference of the heuristic at A to C. What this is basically saying is that the real cost, okay, the real cost of going from A to C is greater than or equal to the cost implied by the heuristic. Okay, so what this means is that the path, the value F along a path, remember our F here is equal to our cost plus our, our backwards cost plus our heuristic at that node. It's never decreasing. And with this, A star graph search is optimal. Okay, let's go through that once again. Essentially what this is, is it's the triangle inequality, right? It's basically saying if you have, an, if you have two approximations, Okay, then the true cost is always going to be greater than the cost or greater than or equal to the cost implied by the heuristic. I find it to be really useful if you actually draw this drawing and you can sort of see it just like that. Okay. Any questions about this? Yes. Uh, so is a, let me clarify it, an invisible but not uh, heuristic that is not guaranteed to find the optimal path of nature? So that's a good question. So the question is, is a heuristic that is admissible, but not consistent, not guaranteed to find the um, optimal solution? That is the case when we are looking at A star graph search. If we are looking at A star tree search, then all we need is admissibility. One other thing to keep in mind is that if you have a consistent heuristic, that also applies implies that it is admissible. So if the heuristic is consistent, then it is admissible. And the specific reason is because this is strictly stronger than admissibility, right? This is saying that the real cost is greater than or equal to the cost implied by the heuristic between two paths. So this is strictly stronger than. So if you have a consistent heuristic, then it is guaranteed to be admissible, okay? I see a question. Yes. No, this graph is not consistent. Questions. Okay, cool. So these are the two big concepts that you should be taking away from the section on heuristic search. Right. For a star to be optimal on graphs, we need that the heuristic is consistent. And for a star to be optimal on trees, we need that it is, is admissible. I am going to briefly go through the proof of the optimality of um, a star graph search. Okay. Now, this is a little bit of a bonus topic. So I usually go through this in my class. Um, if you guys don't understand pieces of it, I'm happy to sort of go over it. It is not expected that you understand all of this, okay? This is just for the people that are sort of interested in the math. So, and you, did you guys see the uh, proof of a star um, tree search in the last lecture? Yeah, and, cool. So basically, it's a very similar idea to what you see for tree search, okay? So what we saw before was that a star search with an admissible heuristic, which is always underestimating the cost, um, is going to be optimal for tree search. So what do we need for graph search? We basically need to be able to prove a new possible problem, okay? So again, we are going to do this by contradiction, okay? So we are going to say that there is some N, okay, on our path to G, okay? Um, and I think I have it here. Okay, some n on our path to G star. Okay, and it isn't in the queue when we need it because there's some worse n prime 
for the same state and it's been dequeued and expanded first. So we're in this really disastrous position. So again, we're assuming that we did something wrong, okay? Let's talk about what that looks like graphically, okay? So that means that there is some N, right? Which is, which is better, right? It's up here. And there's some worse N prime here, okay? And it's been expanded first, well, okay? So you can see it here in the sort of search. Now we are going to take the highest such N in the tree, okay? So we're going to take this N here, we're assuming it's the highest, and then we're comparing it to this N prime here. We're gonna let P, okay? So P is going to be the ancestor of N that was on the queue when N star, when N prime, excuse me, was popped off the queue, okay? So again, this is our P, okay? It's some ancestor of N, right? And it was basically popped off, okay? And so if P is the ancestor that was on the queue when N star was popped, then we can also say, right, that the R function, okay, so again, having our backwards cost plus our heuristic is strictly less than or equal to F of N. Okay, that's because it's the parent. And similarly, we know that F of N is, stri is strictly less than F of N prime because we assume that this M prime is suboptimal. What's the problem here, right? If we have that, okay, if we have our F of P is strictly less, is less than or equal to our Fn and F prime or F of N prime is less than, then P would have been expanded before N prime. And that is what leads us to our contradiction, okay? And the reason that we're able to get this is by our consistency. So again, very similar proof to what you guys saw for a star tree search. The difference here is now we're using the definition of consistency to basically derive the contradiction that we need. Again, this is a little bit of an advanced topic. We're not doing this very strongly, but just so you guys get an idea of the proof. Any quick questions on this? Great. Um, so that's the major part of A star, okay? So um, what do we know about the optimality of A star? These are very important concepts that you might want to write down for something like a worksheet or a quiz. For tree search, <clears throat> excuse me, okay? We know that A star is optimal if the heuristic is admissible and it's non-negative, okay? We're always assuming that our heuristics are non-negative in this class. If you're really interested in what happens with negative heuristics, um, we can talk later. Um, so this is specifically for tree search. We also know that our uniform cost search is a special case. Okay, uniform cost search is basically A star with our heuristic being equal to zero. So why is that the case? Because again, for A star, we have that our cost is equal to our backwards cost plus our heuristic of N. If we're just using our backwards cost and our heuristic is zero, then we're using uniform cost search. Okay. Graph search. As we just showed, A star is optimal if the heuristic is consistent, okay? And here, our uniform cost search is optimal with, again, our heuristic being zero to be consistent. As I said before, consistency implies our admissibility. And in general, most natural admissible heuristics, they tend to be consistent, um, especially from relaxed problems. And that's essentially, um, what you guys will um, see in some of your assignments. So in general, if you find a heuristic that is admissible, they tend to be consistent. Of course, there are some special cases, but if you have an admissible heuristic, you can usually test that it's consistent, okay? So in summary, A star. So A star uses both backwards costs and 
estimates of forward costs, okay? Also, A star is optimal with admissible heuristics for tree search. And the big thing that you guys should take away from today is that uh, heuristic design is the key. Often, we're going to be using relaxed problems, right? So you may have seen in your first homework, often when we're looking at things like Pac-Man, as you will in this class, what's a relaxed problem? It's when you ignore the walls and you just look at your distance, okay? Either Euclidean distance or, um, um, or looking at the um, Manhattan distance. Thank you. Okay. Any questions on this before I move on to the um, next module of the course? Yes. That's a really good question. Are some consistent heuristics better than others? Have people experienced this yet in their homework assignment? Have people gotten to the part with expanding different nodes? A little bit, yeah. So, of, of course. So, some heuristics, and you've actually kind of seen it, right? We already talked about how a very special case of a star is uniform cost search, right? So, uniform cost search is a star with heuristic equals to zero. But as you probably discussed in the last lecture, the problem with this is that we're not guiding it in the right direction, right? Uniform cost search explores all directions equally. So what happens is, is that if you're expanding different nodes with uniform cost search or any other, what you could say, you know, bad heuristic or not, um, I guess, not the most optimal heuristic, of course, it is um, admissible here, is that sometimes it will lead to expanding more nodes. So there are some heuristics that are better than others. Now, there's a trade-off between this, right? Because, of course, <laughs> we would want to use the true cost if we knew it, right? Then we'd, then we'd have the whole problem and we'd be done. But sometimes computing those could be really expensive. So there's a really big trade-off between heuristics, which is basically a trade-off between being able to compute the heuristic easily, but then not being able to get things that are sort of guiding it in the right direction. So again, it depends on your problem. It depends on your state space. But yes, there are some heuristics, some consistent heuristics that are better than others. Yes? I'm curious to know, like, for the heuristic um, for a star tree search, which is to do the Euclidean distance and the Manhattan distance, how would we generate that function, that heuristic function for uh, a star for a graph? Yeah, so, you know, again, when you're looking at uh, graph problems, so usually, you know, as you said, Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance, and usually for your problems, if the heuristic is admissible, you'll see some on your worksheets that are not the case. Of course, we've made those for special reasons. But in general, admissible heuristics tend to be consistent. Um, so depending on your graph structure, they could be consistent. It just depends on basically the, you know, how do you define your distance metric for your state space? Now, the problem occurs when you're talking about things that do not really equate to distance, right? So what if you're trying to find a good heuristic for safety, right? You have to come up with some type of metric. It might not lend to some sort of consistent heuristic. So in open world problems that we see in things like self-driving cars or in robotics, it's, defining these heuristics is very difficult. People spend their entire career doing this. But with things like you know, traveling through a space when you have a, um, you basically have, you know, step cost of one, it's you, the distance metrics are usually just fine. Any other quick questions on this? Yes. So, uh, so if a uh, heuristic is actually uh, close to the, uh, the real world, is that means like the expanding over the world? In general, so if your heuristic is really good, is really close to the true cost, of course, you're going to be guiding your agent then in the right direction, right? So it's probably a very good heuristic. Now, as I said, maybe it's not consistent or maybe it's not admissible for a couple cases. Um, and that can cause some issues, of course. But um, at the same time, in general, if you have a heuristic that's very close to the true cost, it's usually very expensive to compute. So there's that kind of trade-off, and we're not we're not going to get to that in this class, but um, in a more advanced AI class, if you take CSE 240 with me, we do talk about those issues. Okay, any other questions? How's everyone feeling about A star? 
Did you guys figure out, um, did Professor Marinescu tell you where the ASTAR name came from? Any guesses? Maybe because it's the best, actually, that's close, uh, close, a literal star. Actually, both of those kind of put together. So funny story. So the first time I taught this course, someone asked me, why is it called a star? And I actually didn't know. Um, but the reason it's called a star is at the time when they were first working on search algorithms, they had several algorithms. So they had algorithm A, they had algorithm B, and they had algorithm C. And they started making algorithm A a little bit better. So they called it a star. Fantastic. Um, they were really creative back in the day. So funny story. You can tell your guys' friends. Okay. So we finished off module one. And now we're going to be moving on to a very special case of search. Okay. So now we're going to be moving on to what are called constraint satisfaction problems. And you guys have probably seen these in other classes. They're just probably, you've never seen them referred to as constraint satisfaction problems. We will also call these CSPs. Okay. Um, and again, this lecture is going to be basically an intro to the problem and basics. Next lecture, we're going to get to some cool algorithms for doing it. So in general, for most of these modules, first lecture is introduction. What does the problem look like? And then the second um, and sometimes third lecture will be on interesting ways to solve it. Okay, so what did we see? So what we've been looking at is we've been looking at search problems. Okay, and we talked about a couple, say maybe four key things here. Okay. We talked about the problem formulation. What does it mean to be a search problem? How do we express that in a formal way? Um, and then we talked about specific solution methods and heuristics, which largely go ha hand in hand, okay? But the problem here is that there are several caveats, right? We're only looking at one agent, okay? A single agent, it's deterministic, right? It means that we can, we basically know what we're going to do. Don't go down on me today. Um, we already have one computer down. It's um, fully observable. So this is about decision-making under uncertainty. Um, so hold on, for people on Zoom, the uh, projector just went out. Huh? <laughs> Um, okay, hold on. Is it my computer? Okay. It looks like the projector's out. So just a second. Okay. Okay, while that happens, I'm going to switch this because I thought. The projector on? Can someone check? It doesn't look on. I wonder if it went out. Okay. Just a moment. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, are we back? Did it just go out? I, anyway, this is... This is about planning under uncertainty. Okay, so um, sorry for everybody on Zoom. The projector went out. I don't know if the um, screen went out on Zoom, but okay. So back to where we were. So we went through search problems and the big caveats here again are that we're looking at a single agent. It's deterministic. It's fully observable. And sometimes we don't have a fully observable state space. The big thing here is that it's um, what is called non-adversarial. 
So what do I mean by non-adversarial? I mean that it's working alone. It's not competing against other agents. There aren't, you know, people throwing tomatoes in the way of the agent. And so what we're going to be going through today is basically what is called a constraint satisfaction problem, which is a special setting. And it's just a particular form of common search problems. Okay. And the big thing is that we can come up with even better tools for solving CSPs. Okay. So again, essentially what we're going to be thinking about is some type of agent. Okay. And so far, um, we basically had one hammer, which was a star. And now we're going to talk about basically what is a power drill for it to use. So in the analog, we've learned one great type of skill, and now we're going to learn better skills for specific types of search problems. So to motivate constraint satisfaction problems, I'm going to have you guys do a little exercise. Okay. How many people have played Sudoku? Awesome. Okay. So some people are kind of, um, so before, and a lot of what artificial intelligence is inspired by is basically creating and uh, creating agents that can play different types of games well. Okay. So, um, you can read about the rules and all about Sudoku at the wiki, but the big thing is that each Sudoku has a unique solution that can be reached uh, logically without even guessing. You enter the digits one through nine into blank spaces. Every row must contain one digit, okay? So every digit on the row has to only appear once, one through nine. Same thing with the verticals. Every digit can only appear once, so one through nine, and also in every three by three square. Okay, so to get you guys thinking about how do we express constraint satisfaction problems, I'm going to have you guys play Sudoku. Okay, so we're going to take about five minutes. And what I want you guys to do, you can talk to your neighbor. We'll take a little bit of a break. You guys can play the game. So I want you guys to try and figure out the Sudoku board. I also want you to think about what process you're taking to solve it. And we're going to think about how do we create AIs that do that. So we'll take uh, we'll take ooh, about five minutes. Let's take two, you guys take two more minutes. If you haven't yet, tell the person next to you what you're thinking. And then we'll talk about it together.
Okay, 30 more seconds. Uh oh. Okay, so so let's come back. So hopefully that was a little bit of a fun exercise got you guys talking. So part of what I wanted you guys to do here was basically to do what is called metacognition, which is thinking about how you think about the problem. So can anybody share some strategies that they found to be really helpful? Yes. Great. So, so the answer was solve the single digits that are missing first, right? So you mean the, the single digits that were missing? Yeah. So when the problem is really constrained, right? When you have many constraints, then that's a good one to fill in. Great idea. Anyone else? Yes. Find pair relationships between some blocks. So can you give an example? Like the two, uh, two ones, uh, Here. and the seven one and seven two. And the seven two. Uh, no. Oh, no. I, I, I said it all. Okay. So two one. Two one here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Seven one and the seven two. Oh, seven. And, and this and this three is three nine pair. I, I see. Great. So you're looking at the sort of relationship between the constraints and how they affect each other. Great. Any other, um, anyone on Zoom come up with a really good strategy? Give it a minute. Did anybody try to just randomly assign them and then basically move them around? Did anyone try that? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. So that's a perfectly fine strategy as well. So, Again, there are a lot of different things that we could think about, okay? So this is essentially a special case of a search problem, okay? What do you think would be the state space here? Maybe the board. Yeah, exactly. So the different positions of the board, right? Uh, what about the initial state? The initial board, just an empty assignment, okay? What would be the successor function? Exactly, each value that you're setting. And then the goal test would basically be to check if these things are consistent, right? So what we're seeing here is basically this constraint satisfaction problem is a very special case of a search problem, okay? Just as we said, with an initial state being your empty assignment, the successor function being a value that's assigned to an unassigned variable, and then um, your goal test, which is basically that this is assignment is complete and consistent. And we have these rules for what it means to be consistent by the rule of pseudo field. Now, this is a very naive assignment, right? This means we're gonna try every possible, you know, set of configurations and we can do better, right? So essentially what we're gonna be seeing in this class, you've probably seen it so far, is first we're gonna start with something naive and then we're gonna make it better and better and better. So what else is really needed here? Well, you don't just need a successor function in a goal class, right? What you really need is you need to say that every time that you're creating something with your successor function, right, then you have a new set of constraints, right? In the Sudoku board, right, once I put a two in a row, I know that nothing else here can be a two. And I basically need to propagate that every time I set these values. And that's what we're gonna be thinking about with constraint satisfaction problem. So we also need some type of idea of what's called propagating the constraints. So that's imposed by one move, right once we do our successor function and it facilitates an early failure test so that says hey if i've done something and that causes an inconsistency that wasn't a good idea right we fail fast and that's very important for the types of problems we're going to be seeing so 
the big thing we need to do here is we need an explicit representation of constraints and constraint manipulation algorithms. Okay, and this is essentially what leads us to what are called constraint satisfaction problems. Again, the key difference is this idea of these constraints and a way to propagate the constraints so that we fail early if we contradict any of the constraints. Okay. Now, we are going to be looking at constraint satisfaction problems with hard constraints. There's an entire field of what happens when you have soft constraints, but we're not going to talk about those in this class. Okay. So there are really two different classes of constraint satisfaction problems. Okay. So you can either have what are called planning problems, which we've seen before here, where you get sequences of actions. So here, the path to the goal is the important thing. Paths can have various cause, they can have various steps. And we are largely using heuristics to guide and fringe to keep backups. So basically say, okay, if this doesn't work out, we can take this other. But now we're gonna be thinking about identification. So this is essentially assignments to variables. Again, the idea here, if we think about this in the um, Sudoku example, is we are assigning one part of the board to a specific variable, in this case, a number where we might have a set of different choices. Okay, so here, the goal itself is important, not the path. So in this case, we say, you know what, we don't really care the path that we took to get there. Okay, but the important thing is the goal, the output that we get. Okay, and CSPs are a very specialized type of identification problem, and that's what we're going to be seeing here, okay? So, so types of identification problems that you can see, um, things like matching problems, things like scheduling, right? You have a specific plane that you need to use at a specific time to get certain people on the plane. Um, and just like we saw for search problems before, we also need a problem formulation for CSPs, which I'm hoping that we will get to today, okay? So, what is a constraint satisfaction problem? Okay, so what makes this a little bit specialized search problem? Well, we are going to start with a set of variables. Okay, so here we have a set of n variables, x1 through xn. And each variable has a specific domain of possible, of possible values. Now, usually this d sub i is discrete and finite finite. And notice that the domain is defined for each variable, right? Variables can have different domains. Sometimes they have the same domain. Sometimes the domain changes. Over. It just really depends. Okay. Now, for those of you that are maybe more math focused, this should look um, familiar to some things you've seen before. We also have a set of constraints. Okay. So we have a constraint where C1 through CP, if we have P constraints, and each constraint, so each CK involves a subset of variables and specifies the allowable combinations of values of these variables, okay? And we have a goal, okay? So we are going to assign a value to every variable such that all the constraints are satisfied. If we can't satisfy this, then we fail. So let's go through and use this definition for the Sudoku example that we saw before. Um, so in our Sudoku example, we're basically going to have variables x sub 1, 1 to x sub 9, 9. So what does that mean? That means that we have x sub 1, 1 here for the uh, first row, first column. And we have our x sub 9, 9 here in the corner. Okay? And you can basically go through the whole board and set that up yourself. So what about the domain? The domain for every um, variable of Sudoku, it's all 1 to 9, right? Now, the key point is the constraints, OK? And for Sudoku, again, we have three constraints. So we need to have row, um, we have a row constraint, which means that x11 cannot be equal to x12, and all the way to x11 cannot be equal to x19, okay? 
We also have the same thing for columns, okay? This is saying that no row can share the same value. This is saying that no column can share the same value. And we also have the block constraint. So this is saying within any three to three block, the numbering is a little bit confusing, but this is saying that none of those can have the same value. Okay. So this is just formalizing the constraints that we already know for Sudoku. Okay. And then our goal is to assign a value to every variable such that all the constraints are satisfied. Okay. Any questions on this formalization of Sudoku? Awesome. So we've just seen our first example of a constraint satisfaction problem. Now, can people think of other examples of constraint satisfaction problems? Maybe one that you probably see very commonly in computer science. Any ideas? It's map coloring, yay. Um, so we're, we're moving on. So we went through Romania earlier, not turning to Australia. So here, what we want to do is we want to color the map so that no two adjacent places have the same color, okay? So um, here we have a map of Australia, um, North Territory, we have South Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, um, Victoria and Tasmania right here, okay? So here we basically have seven variables. And there are, again, several different examples that you can see for constraint satisfaction problems. Um, we might not get to this lecture, but you'll also see N Queens, which is another very common example. So the seven variables are the seven um, territories of the map. So again, we can uh, create those with shorthands. Each variable, again, has the same domain. They can be one of three colors, okay? Red, green, and blue. And our constraints are that no two adjacent variables have the same value. So those are all written up here. Okay. Any questions on this? I'm showing a very small example and then we'll walk through the process of how we get um, an AI algorithm to do this in general. And then we'll talk about how we do it efficiently. Hopefully this is review. Hopefully this is something you've seen before. Okay. And here is a possible solution, okay? Pretty simple. So you guys have probably seen this before. We'll walk through how to do this in a couple slides, but I wanna give another example of constraint satisfaction problems. And I think that it's really important to see this in an AI class because this is actually an important thing that people use in systems research to evaluate software, uh, or I should say hardware speed, okay? So another example is N Queens. Have people seen N Queens before in an algorithms class? Oh, a few people. Uh, about half the class. Okay. All right. So I will go through it. And for those of you who have seen it before, you can take a two minute nap. So our formulation here for N Queens, the basic idea is that you are using um, for an M by N board, you are putting N Queens on the board such that no queen is attacking each other. So for people that don't know the world of chess, a queen can basically take somebody on the diagonal, um, on the vertical or the horizontal. Okay. So it's actually pretty similar to Zoku, but um, similar type of idea. So the important part here is um, it's a scalability problem. So again, this is used for different types of timing analysis. So people use this for different benchmarks of algorithms. Oh, it could solve n queens and for n equals 100. Um, and so one type of formulation here is that you could use the variables x, i, j, okay? So basically you have, again, each spot on the board. You have domain, so it can either be zero or one, okay? So if it's one, there's a queen there. If it's zero, no queen. And then we can write out our set of constraints which here could be a little bit complicated, <laughs> okay? So let's go through what this means, okay? So essentially you have the same idea that you have before, but now you're writing this for an arbitrarily large board, okay? So remember with Sudoku, we had 
the positions one through nine. Here we're looking at specific end queens. So this is looking at the same row. Okay. So it's basically saying you can only have, we have sort of different sets that this can be here. We have the same for the column. And then we also have here for the diagonal. So we're saying all this is explicitly saying is that we can only have one queen in each column, in each row, and on the diagonal. Okay. But we have one more constraint. Okay. Not only do we have to say that there is only one queen on the column, the row, and each diagonal, we also need to say that we do have, in fact, n queens. Okay. Because if we could have, you know, only one queen, that makes this a really easy problem. Right. So the other thing we need to do is we need to say that we do, in fact, have n queens. So the number, right, of active queens, so the number of ones on the board is, in fact, n. Okay, so this is basically saying that you do have um, n queens in the assignment. Okay. Any questions on this? I know it's a little bit of mathematical notation, but just to get you guys kind of used to what this looks like. Okay, cool. So this is one formulation. Let's look. So I guess before we get there, can anybody point out why this might be a good formulation or a bad formulation? So one thing is it's a little bit complicated, right? Like, I mean, we when we looked at the Sudoku formulation, it was a lot simpler than this. So, you know, essentially there are several different ways that we can think about representing these types of problems. So again, there are many different formulations of problems. That's one of the key takeaways from this class is that creating, you know, we have a lot of problems in the world. We have a lot of problems we'd love to solve with AI. The problem is, is formulating that in a way that a computer can understand. So I just gave one, okay? The other thing you can do is you can formulate this in a little bit more of a, dare I say, interpretable way. So we can basically simplify the notation and say, you know, we're going to have to have a queen for every column anyway, right? We can do the same thing with the row. We can say, oh, you know, we can't have a queen for every row anyway. And what we're going to do is instead, we are going to have a single uh, set of Q variables, okay? Where there's Q1 for the first row, Q2 for the second row, third row, fourth row, et cetera, okay? And then what we're going to say is the domain is going to be one through N, which is corresponding to the column where the queen is. Now, what are some benefits of this? I mean, it's really simple, right? It's very succinct, okay? And now what we have to do is we have to talk about implicit or explicit constraints, okay? Now, when we're explaining computer science problems, like I'm explaining to you, or maybe if you're explaining it to your, your parents, or your friends who are not CS majors, you may want to use what are called implicit constraints, okay? So if, you know, if I was telling my mom what I was working on, I might say, hey, this is the expression I'm using for n queens. I don't even know if we would get to the domain, but we may say that our constraint is that for every i and j, we have non-threatening queens, QI and QJ, okay? But, I mean, same thing, right? There are benefits to this. Obviously, it's very interpretable, and I work on interpretable and explainable systems. Like, it's much easier to understand what it means by non-threatening QI and QJ for every I and J than it is to say, these are my explicit constraints, okay? What would the explicit constraints be? Those would basically be to explicitly define the sets that we can have for Q1 and Q2. We do the same thing for, you know, everything from QI, QJ, etc. Now, when we're programming computers, again, we have to use explicit constraints, right? We can't just tell our computer that we're going to have non-threatening QI. We have to tell it what non-threatening means. Now, there are ways to do that, but that's beyond the scope of this class. So, 
in general, this is good for explaining. This is good for coding. Okay. Any questions on this? Awesome. So um, we are going to go through again another example. So have people seen crypto arithmetic? Anybody? Yay. Okay, something new for everybody. So um, crypto arithmetic, they're like cryptograms. So basically, there are different types of ciphers. So essentially, what you're doing is you're assigning each letter to a different number. And then whatever number you assign, you basically set that to be the equation. Okay. So here, basically, what we're saying is we're saying that O plus O equals R plus some carry, right? Same with W plus W and then T. And obviously, there are some carries here. We're going to go through that. Okay. Um, so these are, you know, really interesting puzzles that a lot of people do. And so here, what we basically need to do is we define our variables, okay, which are essentially all the letters that we have for this cryptogram, okay? Now, as I said before, we also need carries, okay? Because zero plus zero may not be equal to R. It may be equal to R plus some carry, okay? Which is then carried over for this equation. And that's where these variables come into play. We are going to assign each one of these variables a number, okay? A number is zero through nine. Again, it's just, do, it's basically defining a special type of arithmetic. So we will give them the domain. If you wanted to get really creative, you could do that with, you know, different, Different number set, but I would suggest doing that for one to nine. And you have a set of constraints. So basically, you have to say that all the variables are different. This is basically given by the definition of cryptogram. And then you need to define your arithmetic. So again, if we have O plus O equals R, which we do have here, it is equal to R plus some carry right? Plus 10 times some carry bit. You could do the same thing for W and T, etc. okay? The other interesting thing that we're going to see here, and just for a little bit of a preview, is that you can also define this as basically a sort of constrained graph, okay? Where you can basically have this for different types of assignments and different types of connections. Um, we can see that for this particular problem, it's really small, um, but in general, you can create that for larger problems. And for those of you that are interested, you can sort of play with it after class. This is the solution. Okay. So again, all of these are different types of constraint satisfaction problems. And I think I'm gonna go through one more so the other one is thinking about task scheduling. So you guys have probably seen this in an algorithms course. So you can express a task scheduling problem in the form of a graph, right? And you can have a different set of constraints. So you can say, okay, well, T1 must be done before T3. And it's a little hard to see here, but you can basically define that arrow, okay? Which basically can be read as T1 must be done before T3. Again. We're looking at hard constraints. These are things that cannot be violated. Um, there are many other algorithms for soft constraints. T2 must be, must be achieved before T1 starts. Again, arrow pointed. T2 must overlap with T3. Um, we're just going to call it an arrow there, but there might have to be a special sign for that. And T4 must start after T1 is complete. So you can define that as this graph here. Now, are these constraints compatible? Well, we've kind of created a relaxation, right? Like T2 must overlap with T3. This sounds like a really complicated scheduling problem, okay? Um, and finding these types of temporal relationships between every two tasks can be really difficult. Um, this is actually a very difficult problem. This is used for different things like scheduling robots. Again, this is used in things like self-driving cars where you have to have certain 
constraints on relationships. Um, and largely, the types of constraints on attraction problems we're going to be talking about will not be this complex. But I do want to give an idea that these are the types of problems that people are trying to solve, and a lot of them are very difficult. Um, this is also what people use in different types of scheduling, like for classes. Um, so scheduling problems, very important CSP, but in general, the constraints have to be compatible. You have to be able to take the natural language that you have here and express this in a way that makes sense. Now, for those of you who are interested, there are things called event algebras that you can use in these cases. Again, we won't get to that in this class, but if you're interested, I'm happy to talk about that offline. It's a lot of what I do in my own research. So what I'm trying to show with this example here for task to scheduling is that we can have a variety of different constraints. It's not just math coloring problems. In fact, we can have all different types of varieties of constraints. Okay, we can have unary constraints that involve a single variable. So when I'm talking about unary constraints, again, that's looking at one variable. Remember, when we were looking at the map coloring problem, our variables were set to the territory. So we can basically say, oh, you know what? South Australia could absolutely not be green. That is an example of a unary constraint. We can also have what are called binary constraints. So what does this do? This compares pairs of variables so two variables so for example south australia is not going to be equal to west australia okay we can also have higher order constraints that involve three or more variables this is what we saw in the crypto uh, cryptogram the crypto arithmetic and those involve many different constraints you can also have things like preference also known as soft constraints. For example, well, red is better than green. Um, you can you know, often represent these as different costs or variable assignments. So what this is going to lead us to are things called constrained optimization problems. Um, there are, again, entire courses, year-long courses that you can take on optimization and how you solve soft and hard constraints. We won't get to that in this class, but for those of you who are interested, I'm happy to recommend other courses if this is really tickling your fancy. So there are entire areas of mathematics that are completely dedicated to this. Okay. Largely, what we're going to be doing, at least for the next lecture or two, is we are going to be drawing what is called a constraint graph. So again, we are assuming that we are not looking at preferences. That's a whole other class. We are looking at hard constraints, things that absolutely cannot be violated. And again, we're going to be doing that with something that is called a constraint graph. So here, what we've drawn is binary constraints. So that is basically creating a line, drawing an edge between constraints. So between territories that are neighboring, okay? So we are saying that two variables are adjacent or neighbors if they participate in a constraint. Okay, equivalently, you can draw this as a matching problem, but we're going to be thinking about this um, as, again, a constraint graph. So the other thing you can do is you can basically create different types of assignments. These could be different colors for the different territories here. So what do people think that the constraint graph for Sudoku would look like? Anyone have ideas? It might look a little bit complicated, right? So let's think about what the constraint graph would look like for Sudoku, okay? Now, let's recall what we talked about for the Sudoku graph, okay? Each variable is a open square. Our domains are one through nine, and we have different sets of constraints. We have basically what is called all diff. So that means that everything has to be different in each column. We also have that everything has to be different for each row. And then we have to have everything is different for each region. Okay, so again, it's getting a little bit more complicated, but you can kind of see what those things look like. Now, 
we already saw the constraint graph here for crypto arithmetic. Um, but again, these things can get more and more complicated as we get greater and greater in size. So this is sort of motivating what we're going to use for our CSP problem formulation. Okay, so a CSP is a special form of a search problem. Okay, where we have a set of variables. We have a set of domains that the variables can be. And then we have a set of constraints. Okay, so they can be implicit where you have to write code to be able to compute it, right? So an implicit constraint, something like all diff or that they can't be in the same row, or they can be explicit where you provide a subset of the possible tuples. And relating to constraints, we can have unary constraints. So remember that is of one variable. We can have binary constraints where you compare two variables or we can have n array constraints where you look at multiple variables, okay? Now, there's a very, very strong connection between constraint satisfaction problems and NP completeness. So you guys have probably seen these problems before in your um, different algorithms classes, okay? What, class, what classes have you guys seen NP completeness in? Have people seen this concept before? Is it 100, 101? 103, okay, great. So. As was said in the beginning of this class, one of the most interesting things about AI is that usually in the worst case, we're going to get something that's MP complete. So a little bit of a remark here is that when we're thinking about finite constraint satisfaction problems, this includes 3SAT as a special case, okay? Have people seen 3SAT uh, before? So yeah, a little bit. So it's a very special version of SAT. It has special solvers. I won't go too much into it. I'm happy to send links after for people that are interested. But 3SAT is known to be NP, NP complete. So what that means is that in the worst case, we cannot expect to solve a finite CSP in less than exponential time. So what's the key takeaway here? Again, we've seen a lot of really small problems where you guys can play with it. Same with Sudoku, right? In five minutes, I think most of you probably solved it. But in the worst case, we can't expect to solve these constraint satisfaction problems in any less than exponential time. So what we're going to be doing for the rest of this class and into next class is thinking about better ways that we can solve constraint satisfaction problems. Okay. So if we think about standard search formulation, okay, so in standard search formulation, um, we are going to be starting with a standard formulation of CSPs, and we're going to do this in an incremental way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the straightforward way that you would do, a, you would solve a CSP. Gary say a little bit of a dumb approach, let's just call it a naive approach, and then we're going to fix it. So I'm going to say, okay, what if you do this in the most naive way, and then we're going to make it better and better and better, okay? The states here are going to be defined by the values that are assigned so far. So what does that mean? That means that we're going to start with the initial state. So we're going to start with the empty assignment. Our successor function here is going to be to assign a value to an unassigned variable. Okay. And then our goal test will be the, whether the current assignment is complete and it satisfies all constraints. Okay. And to do this, we are going to start with the simplest CSP ever, okay? So we're gonna start with what is called two bits and they're going to be constrained to be equal, okay? Again, very, very simple problem, but just to sort of show how this works. So we're gonna have an X1 and an X2 and they can either be zero or one and we're going to show how we would solve that CSP in a very naive way. Are people ready to be blown away by the simplicity of this example? Yes, great. You guys are probably excited because I know P1 is very difficult. Okay, so again, we are going to look at the simplest CSP here, two bits. So we have X1, we have X2, they can either be zero or one. So we are going to start with the empty set. I know what you guys are thinking, this is so silly, but this is, you know, when we get to more complicated, um problems this is going to be powerful for thinking about how we make this better okay so we have an assignment 
okay? We can set X1 to zero, or we can set X1 to one, or we can set X2 to zero, or we can set X2 to one. I know this is not how you guys were probably thinking about solving this problem, but again, we're doing it in the most naive way, okay? Then, so we make these now equal to our set, okay? And I'm explicitly doing this so that it looks like a search problem because again, a CSP is a special form of a search problem. So if we have that our X1 here is equal to zero, okay? We've already assigned our X1. So we can either set X2 to be zero or we can set X2 to be one. We can do the same thing here. We can either set X2 to be zero or X2 to be one. We could set, again, if we have X2 equals zero here, we could set X1 to be zero or X1 to be one. And we could do the same thing with if X2 is one. We could set X1 to be zero or X1 to be one, okay? We can make that part of our set, okay? So in this case, we have several different states that we can end at, okay? And I'm only showing um, a subset of that here. So if we're setting them to be equal, we have a satisfaction here, we have satisfaction here, and we have satisfaction here, okay? Now, what are, the, what are some of the problems with this? It's very redundant, right? It's very redundant. Um, it's also a lot of work for a very simple problem, right? Um, so of course, there are many things here that are suboptimal, right? And so what we're gonna be talking about are ways that we can make this better. But again, this is a perfectly fine way to think about the problem, but it's not a good way that we would want an AI to do. So let's think how we're going to take the search methods that we already know and then apply them to these types of problems, okay? And again, I'm going to be going back and forth of different examples because there are many ways to think about a constraint satisfaction problem. Okay. So we're going back to the Australia example. Okay. So let's think of what we would do for breadth per search. So if I gave you this problem and I say, I want you to do coloring on this example, what would breadth per search do? Readily, exactly. So if, if we said breath for search, color this graph for us, what it would do is go through everything uh, readily. So it would actually do adjacent coloring, right? So first it would go to, you know, let's just say it would start here at West Australia, and then it would try and color here, and then it would try and color here, and then it would go so on and so forth in different layers. Now, you know, what are some of the issues here? You know, if you make a mistake, it's not going to go back and check it for you, right? And sometimes you don't want to go through things adjacently. Like sometimes there are things that are more constrained. For example, maybe it makes sense to color Tasmania first, or maybe it makes sense to cover to color South Australia because it's the most constrained part of the graph. We're going to get to that. Now, if we did this with depth first search, Again, it would do a similar thing, but it would basically go through a path as deep as possible. And of course, there are problems with that as well. So there's a lot of redundancy. We're not checking the constraints. So it's just having a lot of different issues. And essentially what this is leading to is doing some type of backtracking search, right? Because if we did this with best for search and depth for search, in some cases, we might be able to get really lucky. But in some other cases, we might not. Okay, so again, what this is leading us to is an idea called backtracking search. And this is really similar to the type of uninformed search that we just saw in module one. So we're starting with one type of method and then we are going to make it better. Okay, so what would we do in backtracking search? Well, one idea is that we only consider one single variable 
at each point, okay? Where our value variable assignments here are gonna be commutative. And so we'll just basically fix some ordering, okay? What do I mean by that? I mean that, okay, if we have West Australia is equal to red and then North Territory is equal to green, that's the same as basically switching the order. We're just going to say that they're the same thing, okay? And we'll only consider assignments to a single variable at each step, okay? That's one type of idea. There's another idea. So idea two, you only allow legal assignments at each point, okay? So you only consider values which do not conflict the previous assignment. Now, what's the issue with this? Well, you might have to do some computation to figure out whether a value is okay. And this is leading us to this idea of sort of an incremental goal test. So basically every time you set a value or a set of values, then you make sure that it doesn't conflict with any types of previous assignments, okay? So um, let me give a couple examples of what this looks like. So in this example, this would basically say you fix the ordering. So if we were to bring it back, to the two bits example, this would say that we, we basically get rid of all the redundancy. So what we'd say is, well, we're gonna set X1 and then we're gonna set X2, okay? And here, what this would do in the two bits example is it would say, if you get to an X1 that's not equal to X2, you just throw it out, okay? So if we take these two ideas, then depth first search for constraint satisfaction problems. So if we only consider a single variable at each point, okay, and we only allow legal assignments at each point. So if we add these two checks, then this is what's called backtracking search, okay? And backtracking search is the basic uninformed algorithm for constraint satisfaction problems, okay? And we're going to talk about how good these algorithms are by relating them again back to n queens, because that's a very important sort of historical item of, um, um, of artificial intelligence and different timing analysis. So if we use backtracking search, okay, then we can solve n queens for n equals about 25. Okay. So, um, you know, pretty good algorithm, not the best. We'd obviously like to get that uh, a little bit better. So let's talk about what this looks like, okay? So I'm showing it here with the algorithm. So we are going to start, the initial state of CSP backtracking is an empty assignment, right? That's our start state. And if we define this for an arbitrary assignment A, Okay, where A here is a partial assignment of variables. If A is complete, then we return it, right? That's our base case, we're done, okay? Otherwise, we select an unassigned variable, okay? We just choose one, we choose X, okay? And then we have D be our ordering for the domain of X, okay? So the different ordering of the different uh, values that we could set for X. And we fix that ordering. We don't want to change it, right? That's the same thing as saying, hey, we're going to do X1 before X2. And then we are going to go through each value in D, okay? This is the two, and these are the two checks that we're adding. If V is consistent with A, right? If we don't run into any constraints, then we add that assignment, okay? and then we recurse on that new assignment. So this is with our A with a initial with an um, another set here. So this is A plus our assignment of X equals V. If we if that does not work, okay, then we um, if the result is not equal to failure, then we return the result. If we don't find any values here, so if we go through everything here and we don't find a valid assignment, then we're going to return our failure. Okay. 
Are there any questions on this algorithm? I know it's it's a simple algorithm, but there are some details. So yes, question. Yeah, that's a great question. So do we make sure that we don't go through the same set of variables twice? Um, not necessarily, so we will not go through the same set of variables. Um, I'm sorry, we will not go through the same set of values for a variable, but we might go through the same set of values multiple times if they're the same domain for a variable. So that's exactly why we select an ordering here. So you have to select an ordering so exactly you don't get into that situation. Good question. Um, other questions on this? Okay. So this is again a very basic algorithm. Let's let's see it in action. So what is this going to look like? So let's look at backtracking search. I'm going to just show this for a little bit of a tree here. So we're going to start with the empty assignment. So I'm going to show what it looks like for the tree. And then I'm going to show sort of what this looks like. Again, we're using this with depth first search. So you're going to see something that looks like depth first search. The difference that you're going to see is that now you're filling this up with an assignment. Okay. So we are going to go down our tree sort of leftmost. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to look at this first variable. Okay. So we're assuming that this first variable is called var1 and we're setting it to some value. Value 1, 1. Okay. So at this stage, so once we've gone down one variable, we're going to have one assignment. Then if we continue down the tree, down to var2, then we're going to get another assignment. Okay, we're going to set our, um, we're going to set our var2 equal to some other v21, okay? And then, if we continue down the tree, down this uh, full branch to the left, then we will have an assignment of the variable um, v or var three, and we'll set that to three one or something. Okay. Now let's just say for some reason this fails. Okay. So if this fails, we're going to continue. Okay. So we say, hey, this is a bad assignment, and then we're going to go back up and go down this next node, okay? So again, if this fails for some reason, okay, then again, we're doing depth first search. So the next thing that we will do is we will set our var three here to be equal to the next value that we get from this node, okay? Is everybody sort of understanding this structure? Okay, great. Again, we're just doing depth first search. So if, if it fails, if it says, hey, this is not consistent, we're doing backtracking search, which is basically, again, depth first search. So in the case that that failed, if it said, hey, you know, these two, this was, this was really bad. This did not work. We will pop back up, okay? And then we will continue down another branch here, okay? So again, we're gonna set our value, uh, variable, var2 here equal to now v22, and then we will continue down and set these, okay? So this is working out pretty well, right? It makes sense, it's something we've seen before, but it's really leading us to what are two important questions. So it was sort of brought up a little bit before. So one thing is, which variable should be assigned to a value next? Right. When we talked about the Sudoku problem, some people said, oh, you know, I would choose, you know, that one slot because there are a bunch of numbers around it. Or maybe I would choose to set another variable because there aren't a lot of constraints on it. The variable order matters, and that can make the problem a lot easier or a lot hard harder. The other question is, in which order should the domain be sorted? Right. If we have a set domain, how do we think about what domain to try? Are there certain colors that are better than others? Are there certain numbers that are better than others for Sudoku, okay? And this is relating to what are the 
implications of partial assignments for yet unassigned variables. And this is what's leading us to thinking about our next idea, which is called constraint propagation. So what we're really leading to here is the idea of heuristics for constraint satisfaction problems. I know you guys are probably sick of heuristics from A star, but what we're thinking about for heuristics in terms of constraint satisfaction problems are how do you choose a variable? And then how do you choose an order to assign that variable? Okay, and I'm going to show this on the map coloring problem, and then I think we will end our lecture for today. So, um, choice of variable for map coloring, right? So, um, I'm going to, th through the next couple slides, I'm basically going to show you guys a partial assignment, and then you're going to think about, okay, which variable might I want to assign next? Okay, so again, we're starting with a partial assignment. So you were just given this. Maybe someone started their algorithm and said, hey, can you help me solve this problem? So um, if I was, if I gave you guys this assignment and you had to choose which variable, so again, variables are corresponding to the territories here, which territory do you think that you should color next? Essay. So a lot of people saying essay. Does anybody have a reason why they think that they should do essay next. You only have one option. Great, right? So perfectly good reason. So if we're given this partial assignment, the next choice of variable that we should make is SA. And exactly right. The reason we would want to choose SA is because it is what we call the minimum remaining values. This is also called the most constrained variable, okay? um sometimes it's called fail first okay so essentially what you do here is you're going to select a variable with the fewest remaining values okay exactly what we did we basically saw and said hey you know what sa is the most constrained let's sort of look back there okay tasmania this could be anything we want v it only has two neighbors same with new south wales and queensland SA is the most constrained, and therefore that is what we are going to be using for this choice of variable. Okay. So let's talk about this in a more general sense. So if I gave you this and I said, okay, we're going to try map coloring. Okay. And if you could pick any one to start with, which one would you start with? Probably SA, right? So this is um, related to, again, choosing the variable. And the reason that we want to do this is because, again, it's the most constrained, right? Once we choose that, we've sort of eliminated the hardest choice, okay? And um, another thing we're thinking about here is this is essentially what's doing a degree heuristic, okay? And so this is basically selecting the variable that is involved in the largest number of constraints on the other unassigned variables, okay? So this is one of the key heuristics that we're going to be thinking about for constraint satisfaction problems, okay? Um, and just to sort of finish off, so we talked about variables, and now we wanna talk about the choice of value, okay? So let's say that I've already fixed my ordering, okay? And again, we're not going to be thinking about the choice of variable here. Now we're thinking about the choice of value. Okay? Remember, there are two things that we want to optimize, not only the order of the variables that we assign, but also the values that we assign to that. So if I say I'm going to color Q next, okay? And again, the values in my domain are red, green, and blue. What color do you think that I should color it next? Red, so red's a perfectly good choice. Um, so anyone think another color? So we might want to color it blue, right? So one of the reasons we might want to color blue is because blue has not been assigned yet, right? It gives us the most flexibility for this problem, right? If we color it red, then we we basically are not giving 
choices to essay. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about next time is we're going to be talking more about the choice of value. We're going to be talking about more about the choice of value um, and choice of variable. And I can also go through some of the uh, assignment questions as well. So we'll stop the lecture there and I will see you guys next time.